It's always good. Cool. So without further ado, I'm going to ju uh, jump in. Yes. Okay, so a little bit more about me. Uh, I was on an American reality television show. Uh, it was called House Hunters International, and through clever editing, they made me into a super douchebag. So if you look it up, you can find me on YouTube, and it's a half an hour show about me moving to Denmark. So my goal for today is to provide value. Uh, I'm really trying to give you something that either you can pull out of your hat during a discussion in class, or it's maybe something that you can use, who knows, maybe in a job interview. But there's a lot of kind of uh, case studies and examples in here, and I think there's some value to that. From my perspective, it's always good to get a better feel for what the audience kind of makeup is, so I, I know what level of kind of nerded out to go into. So how many people here work in a startup currently? Nice. Okay. And I assume everybody here is at least taking a course in innovation. Is that correct? Nice. Okay. Uh, and how many people have started their own startup? All right. Good crowd. OK, cool. Well, this should be somewhat relevant. So uh, I talk a lot of shit in my presentation, so bear with me. But I'm going into a lot of the problems with innovation as it currently stands and why Valuer makes so much sense. So the first slide is really contextual under the stipulation of what John Chambers is all about. John Chambers, that dude, uh, former Cisco CEO, chairman of the board uh, of 2018, recently stepped down and basically he had this great quote, which was 40% of Fortune 500 companies that don't partner with startups will become irrelevant in 10 years. The idea is that these big clunky organizations, they're losing out in the long run. And the reality is he got out of that mix to go into venture capital because he sees so much value in some of these small, agile, really uh, influential startups and it's happening right now. So I'm going to hit some of the main points down here, and I don't need to go over them because they're the next bunch of slides. So one of the reasons that a lot of corporates are missing out is talent. So you can't really read this chart here because the text is super small. But the idea is that in order to get amazing people to come work for you, you have to pay them well. Because especially when we all got out of school and when you're still in school, the first thing that you really want to focus on is making some fucking money because you haven't had any because you've been a student forever. So that's why, you know, a lot of people went into investment banking right out of school, because that's where the biggest money was for a very long time. Now it's within tech. And the concept is quite simple. If Facebook is willing to offer an average of 240,000 per employee, I'm going there because I want some motherfucking money. It makes sense. Right. And so the idea is that you look at a lot of these large organizations, even if it's the big four, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, doesn't matter. Right. All of them are competing for the same talent pool. And the reality is they're not compensating people the same way. So the idea is that a lot of the top tech talent are flocking to either what is a better paying situation or what's better for their environment culturally. And you don't see that shift happening as quickly within the large organizations. Uh, they're spending a lot more money on middle management, which is just, you know, it, it's bullshit artists. It's people that are basically just ordering other people to order other people to order other people to do something, which is crazy. I'd rather hire more talented people that actually do the work. So a lot of large bloated organizations, right? Disruptive startups are taking market share and that's the crazy part. So if you look at an Accenture, a KPMG, a Deloitte, a lot of them are losing out. It's death by a thousand cuts. The concept is if you're a small startup and you're taking revenue away from this Goliath, this giant company, and it's happening across the board on every service offering, over time, you lose, right? And so they're starting to realize like, hey, what happens if this trend continues for the next five, 10, 15 years? And the answer is basically, ah, don't worry about it. We're giants, we're good. It's not gonna play out that way. And that's the crazy part, right? So you're losing on all fronts and either, there's, there's two ways to play it, right? And we just say, no, we're a giant organization. We're gonna continue to compete because this is our space, which is absolutely ridiculous and that's not gonna pan out. Or you look at partnering and collaborating, which is what Valuer is all about. Some of the other things that I think are really key, if you ask people that work in these large organizations, it's this point. It's bureaucracy. You know, the size is their downfall. In order to get anything done to make large decisions, you have to have meetings for the sake of meetings, right? It's bullshit bingo. It's sitting in a room with 40 other people 
everybody's just kind of throwing their farts in the air saying, mine doesn't stink, let's do this idea. The problem is that doesn't work, right? There's a, a Jeff Bezos concept of the two pizza rule. The idea is that no meeting should take any more people than it is to feed basically with two pizzas. So eight, eight-ish. Elon Musk just came out and says, I don't do meetings that are more than six people large. There's no fucking point. And there's a million different meetings that could just be an email. But you know, we've had this experience in terms of going up to clients and they have to have meetings to discuss having a meeting with us. Then after we have our initial meeting, they have to have another meeting and then another meeting to discuss what way they talked about in the initial meeting three weeks later. It's crazy. And startups get to do stuff right away because there's less people, there's less input. It's like, let's go. And there's a big difference. And I think that's one of the major factors, right? There's also an element of complacency, which I determine is kind of just laziness. The idea is that if you're 45 years old and you're working for a large organization, um, let's just, I don't want to drop any clients. So um, let's say not BMW, um, but a large company. Let's say that's kind of like the goal. Your, your job was to be a, a director and you've made it. Why on earth do you have to actually go out and learn new things? So I do a ton of speaking, right? Consistently, this is generally the makeup of the audience. It's not 50 plus year old dudes that are trying to get an edge, that are trying to innovate and trying to learn. It's students. It's people that are trying to hustle. It's people that are like, hey, I'm not there yet. I want to learn something cool. I want to get an edge on everybody else that's sitting next to me, in front of me and behind me. A lot of these large organizations have a bunch of people that should either retire or go somewhere else, but not be in my way. And you'd be surprised how prevalent that is. Uh, the example that I give is, is this, right? So this is called the spiral of death. It's where ants basically go in a circle until they get exhausted and entire hives of ants basically die off. It's this crazy phenomenon in nature. And that's what you have in a lot of large organizations is fucking bullshit bingo <laughs> spiraling of bad ideas or continuing to do the same thing and, and there is no evolution, no change. And the last little bit is culture, right? So I'm sure that we've all seen different videos about how millennials or even Generation Z is ruining everything for everybody. But I'm sure when they were the same age, they heard the same things from the greatest generation before them. Fuck that, right? I don't want to dress in a goddamn suit when I go to work. Does it mean any different? Does it make any difference to you in terms of my output if I'm wearing a goddamn monkey suit? Probably not. Most of us probably don't want to do that. I want to be judged on the output, the work that I do. Not necessarily a yes sir, no sir, and all these different uh, ways of kind of looking at culture. Uh, I think it's, it's astounding. You know, when you're in startups, you can lean over to the founders and say, hey, I found something unique here. What should we do about this? In a large company, that ain't happening. You have to go to your boss who goes to their boss and their boss's boss, and eventually maybe it goes down the line of command. But inevitably, it also gets lost in the mix. It's crazy. And a lot of these companies are afraid of change. If I'm a 40 something year old dude and I got a bunch of kids and I don't feel like I have to learn anything. And by the way, I got a mortgage and I'm trying to buy a fucking boat, you know, and there's all these things going on. Why would I want to shake things up? That could be the end of my job. I want things to stay the same. And that's why startups will always end up taking over at one point or another. And the last little, little bit, this is the motherfucker, right? It's revenue. So a lot of these large companies have partners and they're only basing what their bonus structure looks like off of a quarterly basis. So if I know that I need to make a certain amount of numbers every single quarter, why the fuck would I try something new that would result potentially in failure or something that will work out in five years? It's crazy, I wouldn't because I wanna buy that goddamn boat, you know? And it makes sense. But a lot of these guys aren't looking for the horizon, they're looking for their golden parachute. If I make enough money over this span of quarters, I'm out, I get to retire, everything solid deuces. That doesn't work, right? And how does that solve anybody's problems in the grand scheme? And the answer is it doesn't. So what is real innovation? So when I do a lot of marketing presentations, I tend to show this slide and it's, it's not the prettiest thing, but the idea is marketing is all about systems. So if you learn one system really well, you can start applying it to others. So if you understand how to write really good content, you can understand how to do SEO. SEO essentially gets you more traffic. All of a sudden you're like, cool, well, what about SEM? You can start applying these things in different ways. So an interesting case is this guy, John Crowley. Uh, he ended up becoming a United States Senator, 
But this dude had 20 years of finance experience, basically came from the banking sector. And uh, one of his uh, well, second born daughter uh, immediately was diagnosed with, uh, I have it written down here. I always mispronounce it. Neuromuscular disease. Uh, I don't have the exact name. It's a neuromuscular disease. It's basically a, a glycogen storage disease type two. Um, so he goes, cool. So what is the prognosis? How long does she have? Roughly five years. So he's like, all right, cool. I'm gonna drop everything and I'm gonna cure this disease. So he goes out and tries to find all of the experts worldwide that deal with neuromuscular genetic illnesses. Finds them and realizes that they're all doing different things worldwide and says, cool, if I get some money, will all of you guys work together to solve this problem? Yes. So within a matter of four and a half years, the guy solves the illness, right? Cures the disease, sells his company for a cool $137.5 million and went on to the next fucking project. The guy is a Billy badass. And it's sometimes the fish out of water or the person that understands one area really well that can apply the concepts and learnings to a completely different industry. This happens all the time. And, and I think it's fascinating to see that. Sometimes if you ever get a chance to work with engineers, people that are really either good with their hands or maybe it's people that are really good with data, the concept is providing limitations is actually what works. So if you say, I wanna build a factory that makes pens, but it has to be in zero gravity because I want to do it in outer space. All of a sudden, you've added this element of you can do all these things except for this, make something cool. That's where people come up with magic. So, you know, think of like basically optimization meets efficiency with testing. And that's what growth hacking, uh, growth hacking is all about. That's the stuff that I love doing, too. And the idea is that this works in a million different ways. Right. So here's an example. We've all seen this douchebag. Right? So the idea is he comes to a group of people that is far smarter than him and he goes, build me a phone with a camera inside the size of a wallet uh, with no buttons uh, and you know, has YouTube's, uh, YouTube's album on it. I want to show you guys just a quick uh, clip from this because it's fascinating. Um, but when this thing was launched, the first time that people saw the iPhone, uh, when Steve Jobs demonstrated, people lost their shit. And you really don't get, oh, boo. You don't get the effect, uh, I'll put it in my slides. And by the way, if anybody wants my slides, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll send you the slides, no problem. Maybe it helps for a class project or something. But legitimately, people in the audience were like, whoa, because he did this on a phone. Nobody had done that before. And it was, it was mind blowing in 2007, but now everybody's like, yeah, what? <laughs> like, that's not even a thing. So it's crazy to think about. Another example, Elon Musk, right? We're all super familiar with him. By the way, if you ever write content, anytime you include Elon Musk in the title of something, what would Elon Musk say about this? People lose their shit and it gets a ton of engagement. Um, so he basically decided, I'm gonna build a rocket that's cheaper than existing technology, make it reusable, and it will carry a bigger payload than existing alternatives. For those that are not necessarily into uh, aeronautical engineering or rocketry or uh, you know, rocket science, the idea was that the fuel wasn't the expensive part. It was the fucking boosters on the bottom of these things that cost a million dollars. If you can save the booster, all of a sudden you're making money hand over fist. That's what this dude has figured out and he's balling. He's got a bunch of different companies where he's figuring things out. Uh, WeWork is an interesting one, right? These guys have purely done it off of branding. WeWork offers nothing unique. All they're doing is saying, we only want to procure awesome spaces for offices in the hearts of big cities. And then we want to basically rent it out over a long term. We want to make rent cheaper. We want to require basically no long term leases. And we want to rent individual seats as opposed to entire offices. They've taken over the fucking market. But things are getting shaky over there. I don't know if people have read what's happening with the IPO. It's going to get pretty wild. But there is a competitor to these guys in terms of WeWork being valued at 47 billion with a B, there's a company called Regis. Regis basically has more office space. They own more of their office space. These guys own very little. They're gigantic. They're all over the world. They have more square meters in terms of space, yet they're only worth 4 billion. Can anybody guess why? It's just, it's marketing. That's it. We work as a culture. When you go into those places, it's immaculate. It's gorgeous, right? And for whatever reason, people are like, I want to be a part of that tribe, you know? And it speaks to people. Uh, last little example is Ikea. Uh, Ikea decided, okay, if autonomous vehicles are going to be a thing, why don't we bring 
the thing that you want to go to, to you. So it's a mobile pharmacy, it's a mobile coffee shop, maybe it's a mobile Ikea, who knows? The idea is that when we are not necessarily having to sit in a car and do this, maybe other things will end up being part of our experience. Maybe it's working out, maybe it's getting a haircut on your way, who knows? But that shit's coming. And it's one of Ikea's biggest investments and it, it's crazy how that's actually panning out and that will be part of our future. One of the quotes that I, I tend to, to focus on, and, and it kind of goes back to that Steve Jobs concept, uh, it's really the last line that gets me. It's any sufficient uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? So like the first time that you were able to do Google Street View, you're looking at either your phone or your laptop, you're like, that, that's right there, and I, I know where that is. Like it blew your mind at first, and then a week later you're like, oh yeah, yeah Street View. You know, and it, we all do that. So how do we get there, right? Uh, this is more so from a leadership standpoint and how to make sense of kind of what innovation means in terms of implementation, uh, implementation and also doing the work. So like I, I, I did a, a conference not too long ago, I think it was called like digital, so many bullshit buzzwords, like Digital Innovation Fest or something. It was really bizarre. Uh, the guy that organized it was like, Hey, uh, do you want to be the host? And and that was like the morning of, and I'm like, uh, sure. And he hands me the pamphlet, and he's like, those are the list of speakers. Uh, just walk around and find out who they are, and get everything on your laptop and and host it. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like I thought I was presenting for an hour. Super bizarre. Um, but one of the things that I, I got out of a lot of the people that were leading innovation departments in this really small conference was their lack of direction. And the idea is that you have to, as the leader, demand the change. It's all about you, right? If you are the CEO, you need to stand up there and say, what we are doing is not going to be the same tomorrow, next year, or the next five years. If you can't handle instability, get the fuck out, because we have to do something here. Otherwise, there's a lot of jobs on the line. And I'm gonna show what happens when that doesn't play in, right? Uh, I love this speech. This is uh, the We Choose to Go to the Moon by John F. Kennedy. It, it inspired an entire generation of people to look towards space. Uh, I used to play it when I get really fucked up with my friends and we would put on a Boston accent. It was a ton of fun, but it, you know, like it does inspire and you'd be surprised how hard it is to find somebody at the very top who is that inspirational. So this is a picture of the original Nokia. Nokia started as a paper mill, right? They made paper out in Finland uh, and they started in 1871. They were in business uh, and doing reasonably well for 150 years. Over time, they had to continue to change with the market. Paper is obviously not what they're manufacturing now, but quite frankly, they're not doing a whole lot of anything right now. The idea was basically, they peaked during the 90s. At one point, they were worth $70 billion. Every third person had a Nokia phone that was indestructible, if you guys remember the blue ones that were out there. Uh, those things were fucking great, um, but the idea was, they had 160 phones in circulation during their peak. In 2011, they were on their way out. They had lost crazy amounts of market share. Uh, the CEO, I love this guy, Stephen Elope, basically gets in front of the entire company and all their shareholders and basically relates his uh, situation like a man standing on a burning platform. He's like, I feel so bad for myself, you know? And it's one of those things, the stock plummets, Right? And they basically lose 1.3 billion overnight. They have to fire people in the tens of thousands. And these are people's fucking lives, right? Uh, if you go to Finland, so like some of the fun events that we go to, whether it's uh, Shift or Arctic 15, people still talk about how bitter they are with Nokia because they had leveraged their entire livelihood for the future and retirement on a company that went poof and it was over. 10,000 people per month for months on end over crazy you know and, and and it's not like there's a million different examples of this so like more recently boeing if you've read anything about boeing in the news they basically crashed two fucking planes uh into the ground one of which uh was in ethiopia the other uh well lion air and ethiopian airlines uh they were hiring nine dollar an hour indian dudes to program all of the navigation software what the fuck are you guys doing? Are you serious, right? And the reality is if you found a startup that was really into navigation or something in the way of development for aerospatial, uh, I don't know, radar or 
navigation, uh, I have a feeling that we wouldn't be talking about Boeing the same way today. The idea was they were trying to cut corners and they weren't looking for the future. They were looking to get it done today. That's a major fuck up. And by the way, you know, their, their, uh, their, their customers are going after them now. Not just the families. I mean, they're out for billions. This is 346 people that died. It's the customers that are really going after them. So a company called Avia ordered eight jets. They put down a $35 million investment. And then they turned around after this big disaster and said, cool, so we want $75 million back because you cost us money uh, and we have to reshuffle. And I want interest on my $75 million. It, it's, it's fucking baller. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, I can't blame them. Accenture. Accenture is one of the, the bigger employers out in Denmark. They built, uh, by the way, I'm talking a lot of shit, but I mean, they, they know better, right? So Accenture was supposed to redo Hertz's website. They spent $32 million and delivered nothing, zero, right? And they're still in litigation now to figure out what the fuck is going on. It's crazy. And if you had brought in an in-house amazing development agency inside of an innovation platform to test all the user experience, and be able to then use them as kind of your go-to partner, maybe that collaboration would have been something amazing, but we're not talking about that right now. Danske Bank decided they didn't want to do anything in the way of fraud detection, fintech startups, so they decided to launder money to drug lords, and that's working out for them, right? GE can't get out of their own way. GE used to be like their signature thing for a very long time was dishwashers and light bulbs. They've had to sell off their fucking light bulbs because they can't get out of their own way. They don't know how to innovate. And these are things that require people like you, people like startups that are, are really driven to come in and shake things up. I had a really interesting short conversation with Gary Vaynerchuk over at Arctic 15. I guess it was two years ago, time flies. Um, ask me for the presentation or if there's time at the end, I'll play his answer. Um, but the concept is there's a reason why a lot of these companies go the way of the dinosaur. It's because they don't give a shit. They're only after short-term gains. And it's all the things that I mentioned before. There's a big difference in culture and shit's happening fast, but some people do get it, right? So some of my favorite companies that are actually making stuff work is X or Google X. So the idea was they take a problem that's affecting millions or a lot of their core customers and say, let's find a radical solution. We'll test it and then we'll optimize for efficiency and see if we can make some fucking money out of it. This is the whole idea of what impact is supposed to be. Not like make everybody feel like warm and fuzzy, fuck that noise. Actually make some money off of people while also doing something good, right? So the idea is you have 1.2 million people that die in a car accident every year. We decide let's figure out a way so that these cars know when to stop if there's some drunk guy doing this headed in your direction. Hopefully that's supposed to work out that way. Guess what their navigation is based on and guess how they can serve you local ads? Through Google, right? There's 4 billion people on the planet that don't have access to the internet. It's called the uh, moonshot, right? The whole idea is they're building weather balloons that go up to way up in the upper atmosphere above where the, uh, the planes fly. And basically it gives a strong enough 3G signal for these people to get online. Guess what search engine they're gonna use for their searches. Guess where they're gonna get ads from. Fucking Google, right? But they're solving a problem at the same time. That's what impact is about. Not giving people fucking flip flops and saying, hey, we did a good job. If you buy one of our shoes, I'll give this guy a shoe. You know, like, it's crazy. Uh, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of doubting the whole concept of impact. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that claim to do it because it sounds good for PR, but some people actually do a real good job of it. And, and I do admire those that are actually winning on it. Uh, so collaborating with startups, this is what Valuer is all about. Uh, and the first example that kind of came to the top of my head when uh, Daniel will go over the blitzscaling kind of methodology but when we first sat down with these guys, uh, Silicon Valley dudes, um, really interesting approach in terms of rapid growth of existing startups that need to go into more of a scale-up stage. I, I kind of looked at it like the aging Olympian or the out of shape Olympian. Uh, and as I, I explained this to uh, the author of the book, Blitz, uh, Blitzscaling, Chris Ye, like it was funny to look over at Dennis. He's like, what the fuck are you? So it was great. So, so this is Rulon Gardner. Uh, and this is also Rulon Gardner. And he won the Olympic gold uh, for the United States, what's up, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, and basically 11 years later, he was on a television show called The Biggest Loser. Uh, and it was basically a show for people to lose weight. Uh, the idea is basically a lot of these large corporations are the same kind of, hey, we won gold back in the day, we're still awesome. And it's like, no, you're not. 
Are you kidding me? Like you're bloated, you're out of shape, and you're not doing the same things that you were doing before. Everybody's still like crowing from the rooftops. I did something amazing in the year 2000 or the, the year 2004. Nobody gives a shit, right? What are you doing for me today? And the idea is a lot of these companies need a change in their attitude. And so that was kind of the solution that Valuer offered, but also this is kind of the landscape for innovation. You need to change your attitude and that comes from the top, that comes from in here, right? And the idea is that if I were to dump off a bunch of veg uh, vegetables and like farm to table, organic, uh, really delicious stuff, fresh produce to a fat dude's apartment, I guarantee you he wouldn't eat it. The problem is you have to show him how to cook it, right? So that means, hey, startups. Startups are those fresh ingredients. If we dump off a bunch of startups over at a large company, they're gonna look at us and be like, the fuck are we supposed to do with this? The idea is somebody needs to be a personal chef and show them how it's done. Then it's like, okay, great. Now we got a better diet going. Why don't we get you in the gym? Personal trainer, which means there has to be consultants that help you within these innovation labs. And all of this is cyclical. It's a perfect metaphor, but I gotta move on. What am I doing on time? Let's double check. I'm good, perfect. So startups are different, right? There's a big difference in culture, and this is stuff that I continually have to kind of put in front of a lot of these uh, CTOs, people that are running innovation departments. The idea is that you know, the passion is more important for me. These are people that give a shit. They've made it their life, their life's work, their life ambition to solve this problem. I'd rather have that dude working next to me 24 seven than some dude that's like, hey, it's just another project. I got put on this team. There is a difference, right? If I'm trying to solve a real problem and that's my startup and I own it, I'm going to work day and night to get it done, right? And I've been there, trust me, it's a real thing. But if it's just inside of you know an R&D department, look, uh, I can give a shit. Either way, I'm getting a paycheck, you know? And like, that's real, right? So they got into business for the right reasons. They're used to, if they're coming from a startup background, they know what it's like to be bootstrapped. They know what it's like to not be able to just make it rain. And a lot of these large companies don't have people that are aware of how much money it costs to do things or whether or not it makes sense to do things that are that expensive. Uh, and you know, the last little bit, uh, not to fuck with you guys, but it is, it is interesting. Uh, there was a great Harvard Business Review article that came out about grit versus IQ. The idea is that if you are willing to work day and night and you have this uh, impenetrable force behind you, which is called grit, which means I'm getting shit done, it doesn't matter where you went to school, right? And that doesn't really work for this place because you guys are going to one of the better schools in Denmark, kudos. Uh, but I mean, fucking A, it doesn't matter where you went to school or what your IQ is. If you can stay focused and work hard enough and long enough on something, you'll outpace everybody. I'm a perfect example of that. I was a psychology degree, right? I don't have a master's. I'm a CMO of a really nice growing startup here in Denmark. And I fucking hustle. I have people beating down my door, offering me jobs, still saying no, but you know, it's crazy. Uh, and the reality is you can outpace anybody if you give a shit. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm into this stuff. Like this is my jam. Some people wrench on old cars on the weekends. Maybe they do CrossFit, whatever your fucking thing is. I do this, like this is fun for me. This is what I get up in the morning. I sprung out of bed to get here today. So when you're looking at startups, it's really interesting to sit with venture capitalists and ask, what is the determining factor between a startup that you invest in and one that you don't? What is kind of the key differentiator? And they always give the same answer. People, people, and people. And it's like, yeah, yeah, what else? Like, oh yeah, people. The idea is they want to invest in people that they have the confidence that if I give you money, you're going to give it back to me at some point because I know you're gonna hustle until it's done or it's already dead, you know? And that's the idea. So where do you find startups? So of course there's accelerators and incubators. You can't swing a dead cat in this town without hitting an accelerator or incubator. There are tons. Uh, and if you're looking to get involved with one of these places, it's a matter of showing up and saying, uh, can I just walk around and hand out my resume? I guarantee you, you'll get an opportunity. And because it's Denmark and people don't like to like talk to each other, nobody does it. But you can get a job tomorrow doing that if you really wanted to. Uh, competitions, pitch events, startup conferences, events, uh, these things are a dime a dozen. So like one of the biggest ones in Europe, Slush, uh, I think it was like 40,000 people last year. It was a clusterfuck and a half. I don't understand how these investors are able to manage these meetings throughout the span of only two days. You can only have so many meetings. And by the way, after your fifth meeting, 
these things start to blend together. You forget if you've gone on more than four Tinder dates, right? It's the same thing. You forget kind of like the personality and what was said, and it's just all kind of the same thing. So a lot of these uh, venture capital firms and corporate VCs tend to use events as their main structure. Hackathons, hackathons are great for marketing, but nothing ever really comes from them as far as I'm concerned, unless the startups are actually engaging with core leadership, otherwise it's a joke. Schools and academia is great. Random Googling works, right? Everybody's got the internet. Uh, Angel.co and Crunchbase, but I can tell you right now, a lot of startups that are early stage, that are really lucrative, are not on Angel.co or Crunchbase, or at the very end, you have Valuer. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about startup implementation, then I'll jump right into Valuer. Uh, how am I doing on time? Cool. I have time. Uh, okay, so it was funny. So like when I first interviewed with uh, Daniel and Dennis, uh, the analogy that I used was something that I experienced back in uh, DC, Washington DC. The idea of startups working with some of these large companies is this difference in culture and the idea of taking a large company and saying, great, now pull in this little group of people that has a good kind of jive with each other, everything's working, and tell them to work under your rules, it never fucking works, right? So the CEO, Dennis, basically sold one of his most recent companies, and uh, within two years, everybody or most people had left because it was super frustrating. The idea is you can't take the fastest fish in the ocean, throw it on land and say, swim, bitch! It doesn't work that way, and it never will. Just like you can't throw a cheetah in water and be like, do what the sailfish does. You got it. It doesn't pan out, right? And the reality is a lot of these people don't get that. They try to squeeze people into their own teams and it never pans out the right way. The idea is it's a light touch. And, and that's one of the things that I wish we could consult on, but we don't do consulting. It's this light touch that nobody seems to get, what, uh, get right. Uh, last little bit, failure incentives. This dude has an awesome name. His name is Astro Teller, which like makes him sound like some creepy oracle from the Matrix. Um, but he talks about in his TED Talk the failure bonus. The idea is that if you decide to kill a project within Google X or X, you're rewarded for that, right? If you figured out logistically it's not possible because blank, or it's not scalable because blank, or the technology is not uh, sufficient for us to be able to actually build this in, in this year, then we have to shelve it. Everybody gets a reward for that. If you do that inside of a large organization, everybody freaks out because they're like, what the fuck? Like, these are our jobs. We, we can't kill this project. So people end up doing the right thing for too long. And they end up wasting thousands of, of, of hours, which is millions of dollars on stuff that will never see the light of day. So it's a really amazing thing. And, and this is something that corporations need to understand. Uh, I have not yet failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thomas Edison. Uh, last little bit on innovation, if, if anybody's ever heard of the Pareto Principle, it's 80-20 rule. The concept is not every startup will be a gem. And I gotta tell you, I've met tons of like shithead startup founders that have no business being in the startup scene. It's crazy, right? You know, it's like, we don't need, <laughs> we don't need a cock flavored popsicle. I don't understand why you're building that. But here we are and we're talking about it and you're looking for money. And sometimes lightning strikes, right? But the reality is 80% of these startups that go into these innovation labs that are even well vetted out are going to fail. And that is a complete counterintuitive 180 turn to what a lot of these large companies are used to. You have to embrace failure so that the next one, you have something to be able to learn from. And, and it's happening right now. I've already covered some of the bullshit bingo uh, and the two pizza rule, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, let me hit valuer real quick. So our solution is really unique and it's, it's fun being a part of a company where people actually get what the fuck you're doing. So like one of my first startups was called Gluten Free VIP. Uh, <laughs> so terrible name, terrible idea. It was an app because it was 2012 and why the fuck not, right? Because everybody's got an app and it was allowing you to discover food on it. And I can't tell you how debilitating it was to try to explain that to people. And they're like, this is like the worst idea I've ever heard. So like working on something like this, tons of fun because people get it. Right? So the concept is we are basically, we're connecting startups with corporations. It's really simple. A lot of these large companies don't have the time to hit events. Even when they do, it's super inefficient. And the alternative is they hire startup scouts named Chad to basically ring people up and be like, uh, yeah, show me what you got. And then if Chad has some type of kinship with you, great. You have investment now from that company. 
it's like one startup analyst. We want to replace that guy and about a dozen other people in his department. So the whole idea is we offer a discovery mechanism that basically uses a mixture of data mining and human elements. Uh, we use an agent network, which I'll go into. We track these startups as far as uh, their growth, uh, revenue, uh, growth patterns in terms of backlinks and the way that the traffic is growing on the site. And then we validate these. Using our machine learning platform, we have 70, the number keeps jumping around. It was 73 and now it's 77, but the idea is it's 77 different fields that are basically an indicator of whether or not a startup will be successful over time. So think about it like this. If you are a single co-founder with no other co-founders and you have zero experience in a field, you are far less likely to be successful over time compared to if you are a startup team of five people and each of those five people has 15 years of experience. It's, I mean, it's obvious and it's basic math, but people are like, oh yeah, it does make sense. It's crazy, but it works, right? Uh, and the last little bit is we deliver matches. So here's one of, I'd, I'd say like the biggest differentiators is we work with a lot of agents. They're peppered all over the world. These are people that are super active in the startup scene. They go out to lots of events. And when we put out a mission or a radar and we basically say, company X is looking for a startup that is pre-seed, has at least X in generated revenue, uh, does this type of technology that's in this sector. What do you got? And all of a sudden we get flooded with startups that we've never heard of. They're not on angel.co, they're not listed anywhere. A lot of times it's super nerded out students. A lot of the people that come to our website and submit their startup as uh, you know, a considered startup for our platform, those aren't always the ones that we want. How do you have time to find startup websites that aggregate startups like yours? Like you should be hustling on your product. And that's kind of the differentiator. Uh, in terms of the, there we go. In terms of the validation, we have 300 plus experts on the platform. The idea is basically before we deliver anything to the client, we wanna have somebody that's in the space that says, does this pass the sniff test? Is it possible to do this type of hardware? Is this real? And often, you know, the results are like, no, these guys are full of shit. I'm like, don't put that one out there. Or it's like, yeah, they're amazing. Like, I love this concept. I wanna connect with those guys. So the idea is that actually gives just a little bit of benefit to the, the end client, which is the large corporation. And the last little bit is delivery. I, I make fun of this, but it's real. The concept is we deliver a magazine at the end, something that looks exactly like this, right? We also deliver it on a platform. The problem is a lot of the people that are running this stuff are dinosaurs. And that's the crazy part where it's like, if I put this information in a giant database, you wouldn't look at it because it, you know, it would take you too long. You don't want to sift through stuff. You want it simple. <laughs> and that's the problem. Like, I, I can't tell you how frustrating this is sometimes where it's like, if I put anything that I need you to know on the back of a fucking cereal box, would you read it? You know, and that's what we have to do sometimes. But this is actually making a difference is it's giving somebody a curated version, a short version of startups, rather than saying, here's a list of the 400,000 startups we have in our database. Here's the, sw the small version. I, I cut all the BS, did all the searching, validated all of these, they're right here. Pick them up, use them, collaborate with them, partner with them. So in five years, you're not scratching your head going, how did we lose out on this entire sector? And that's a real thing. So last little bit, uh, Valuer, we were uh, voted the best new startup in Denmark uh, from the Nordic Startup Awards. Uh, we talked about going for that again this year, but it'd be weird if we lost uh, because we were nominated, but then lost. So we're not going after that award, but uh, there's a bunch uh, in those categories. We've grown by 200%. Uh, percent. I think that's actually, uh, it's probably closer to 400 <laughs> over the last year. Um, this was a slide that I used for uh, CBS's pitch day. Uh, 15 plus nationalities. We have new customers and partners every month. I mean, it's, I've never gotten a chance to sit on a fucking rocket ship before. And like, this is the first one. That's also why I'm like crazy excited about it. And we're continuing to expand into new markets. It's, uh, it's a fun place to work as well. Um, we have awesome Friday bars, uh, we get weird. Uh, we also work together really well. And it's, it's a really just fun, uh, easygoing, and also aggressively awesome startup to work with. Um, that's it for me. If you want the slides from today, um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, we're constantly looking for people whether it's in marketing, sales, or any of the other areas. Um, I almost give jobs to anybody, but they're unpaid, so there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thanks, guys. I hope this is relevant.